Uh, we are recording for the 2019 Extension Master Gardener Connect Series. I want to welcome everyone to a new Extension Master Gardener training year. I'm pretty excited about um, where we are going. We have three really good presentations this year. Uh, Dennis is going to kick off our series with critters and uh, snakes. Um, I don't know if I'll get to snakes, just critters. I'll, I'll make it better for you. How's that? Thank you. Um, and uh, just to let you know that we do have Slido up again this year. Our code for this week is 3492. It is up and going. So on either your computer, um, your cell phone, or your tablet, please go to slido.com. Um, enter the 3492 in the join um, spot and then we'll ask you questions periodically throughout the um, presentation. So the first question is just a basic question asking who you are, where you're at, um, and then your email address. So just kind of getting it going and I'm going to turn it over to Dennis and he's going to talk all about critters in your landscape and what you need to do to deal with them. So it's all up to you, Dennis. Okay, so we're going to talk about wildlife in the landscape. And let's see, we can't see if we can get this thing to go forward. There we go. So we most of the information is in the. Uh, we see your screensaver. We don't see your presentation anymore. You don't? No. Just go down to your. Sh there. There you go. How about now? Now, now we do. Okay. Some reason it keeps. Okay, how is that? Okay, so most of this information, a lot more, will be in the got the extension guide, um, wildlife damage management for Nebraska Master Naturalists. So, plus we have the website, which is just wildlife.unl.edu. And you just go straight to that website and it has all the species there. Um, you go, go to the damage part. There's also a conservation part and identification part. And you could help the client with whatever they have. And you can have the client go to that website, wildlife.unl.edu, as it's shown there on the screen. And all the NEB guides are on there. All the videos that I've done with for wildlife uh, concerning uh, most of the common wildlife and including all our backyard farmer videos are attached to the different species at that website. So, and there's a QR onto it, so people can actually load it right onto their phone, be out in the yard, see something, bring it right up on their phone, compare it on their phone, and decide what they have, hopefully. If not, they can take a picture of it send it to wildlife.unl.edu, ask the expert, not email us, but ask the expert, and then it goes to my phone, I'll look at it, and I can tell them what it is, okay? If I'm someplace where the phone is. So as we move forward, see if we can get it to go, there we go. I'm going to start off this time with white-tailed deer, uh, mainly because lately the calls I've been getting and the emails I've been getting um, are on white-tailed deer. Now, white-tailed deer are very common um, throughout most of the eastern part of the state, but they're also in other parts of the state as, along with the mule deer. And control for both the white-tail and the mule deer are very close to the same. So with deer management, University of Nebraska has gone through a wide variety of ways to control deer. Um, we have found things that work and things that don't work. The spank and release doesn't seem to be working very well. So we'll go by the spank and release uh, and go to a little more intense management. Um, one thing, make sure it's deer and not rabbits or elk or something else. Deer are browsers. So when deer are damaged, they'll chew it off or nip it off. And it's pretty much straight on a 90 degree angle. It is not on a 45 degree angle or off to one side. 
To stop that type on small trees, you can go with exclusion. It's probably the most economical way to do it. And this is a, a collar or a fence around the small trees. Now, the things they like the best are white pines. Um, and we have a whole list on the NEV guide that's a page long on trees that they like, trees that they kind of resistant to, and trees they, a small list of trees they don't like. Uh, unfortunately, most of the ponderosa pines, the spruces, the white pines are on the list they like the most. And that's a lot of things we like to plant in the landscape. So these need to be protected until they get at least about one inch uh, in diameter and uh, taller than about 10 foot tall if possible. Um, you want to protect them for their full height and you want to stake down the protection uh, as you can see here with some kind of stake so this deer cannot pull this off, which they do do from time to time. When the trees get bigger, you want to not only stop them from browsing, which if they're above 10 foot, they can't get above it to browse. Um, if you got deer that are taller than 10 foot, we're all in trouble. Um, but what we can do is protect them from rubbing against them once they get to be one inch to two inch in diameter. And so we put a protection around the tree, as you can see here. Now this protection is put on usually in the fall and is cut off for the summer. Okay, because there's not going to be much rubbing in the summer. So leave it on till about April, May, and then clip off um, so it doesn't girdle the tree and allows the tree to breathe. And then when October comes, you can put the protection back on the tree. Um, and you want to put this at least six foot up to stop uh, those animals from rubbing. Sometimes we have to go up to eight foot up to stop them from rubbing. As far as repellents, um, a lot of the repellents work fairly well. Uh, there's some that don't work as evenly, but what we're finding is most of these repellents work great when it's not below freezing. Unfortunately, deer do most of their damage on trees and landscape stock when it's in the winter. And so things like deer way, the coyote urine in the deer zone, and deer off, um, show some great prevalence on stopping at least 50% of them feeding on the tree, but not when it's below freezing. Very few things work when it's below freezing. And if there's ice cover and everything like we have on the eastern part of the state right now, these items are completely worthless. So we have to remember, yes, these things may work, but when are they working? And it's one of the things they don't tell you on the label. They'll tell you university test it works 90% of the time or 50% of the time. Well, that, they test most of these things in the summer. So yes, soap, bars of soap work. The thing that works the best in the summer is something that has a protein pugent smell like rotten eggs and the coyote urine seems to work fairly well in the summer months. But even when you apply these things in the winter, it gets cold at night, it freezes at night, and the olfaction of these items is not there. And the repellency is down to maybe 10%. So for the winter months, we're almost put back into things such as exclusion, okay? And that's why I went through those exclusion devices for you in the beginning. So repellents are fine during the summer months, but for the winter months, we have to resort to the exclusion. Now, if you have a large area and you have deer browsing on things like sweet corn, this is something that Scott Hankstrom, uh, a previous um, professor in our department, uh, came up with and it has excellent results. And this is what we call the peanut butter and foil fence. I used it on my acreage and it worked great. All you do is put one line of electric fence around the sweet corn, okay? Uh, and you put the wire up about two and a half foot if you're worried about deer. And you only need to put a stake because this is one strand of tinsel strength electric fence uh, every 50 foot. So it's fairly economical to do this. And use a regular electric fence charger. So no, they can't be used in most cities such as in the sea limits of Grand Island, Lincoln, or Omaha. You can't have the electric fence. Um, but outside those areas you can. 
And what you do is about every three foot, um, I use aluminum foil and I don't use adhesive tape. I just put peanut butter um, on the fence and squeeze the aluminum foil around the peanut butter. And you have to replace this about once every other week in the beginning. And what happens, the deer, and even raccoons do this, they come up and they smell that peanut butter, even in the winter, and they put their nose to the aluminum foil and it knocks them right to their haunches. And then they won't, they can walk right over this fence, but they don't because they re relay that. And I did this for three years in a row and by the end, the electric fence went bad and I didn't have one piece of uh, corn, sweet corn taken by the deer once, this fence, once they were all trained in the area. And it's fairly economical and works great, especially for small gardens up to an acre. The offset fence is more for big nurseries where you have several acres. Now you could put a fence that's nine foot tall with three lines of electric on top. That's expensive and cumbersome. The slant fence has two lines of high tensile wire, not electrified, on the outside, the deer side, okay? And one is on the uh, close to about 15 inches above the ground, and the second one on the outside is 43 inches above the ground. And then on the inside, you have a second fence, and that second fence is about 50 inches inside, okay? excuse me, 38 inches inside, 52 on the corners because you're going around the corners. On that one on the inside, you put only one wire and that one wire is 30 inches up. And most deer, either, either fawns, bucks, and does, when they try to jump this configuration, they get caught and they back out. And it's about 90% effective. So this one's great if you have a larger nursery. Uh, it's not electrified. So you're saving some money there. Um, and it, again, using high tensile, not barbed wire, but high tensile sh single strand wire. And it works very well. So that's another way to exclude them. That works well. Okay. We don't have any questions on deer. We're gonna move to rabbits. Another one we've been getting a lot of calls on lately um, with, is with the rabbits. Um, Rabbits this time of year are doing quite a bit of damage by girdling trees. Um, and it's, this is the time of year we can use trapping to get rid of them. First of all, let's identify if it is rabbits. One thing about rabbit damage, it's usually always on about a 45 degree angle and there's a tab to the damage because they are not a rodent, they're a lagomorph and they have peg incisors. So you have this tab all the time. A squirrel will be a straight 45. A deer is a 90 degree cut. But if it's a 45 degree cut and it has these tabs, okay, right there, you can see it started on a 45 and so it starts there and goes to there. This was a clean 45 and you have these tabs on top. Now they can also girdle and you can see here where they girdle a tree. The girdle marks will be at least two quarter inch grooves, quarter inch wide teeth on a rabbit. This is how we identify rabbit damage from vole damage or mouse damage or some other critter. So on this, if you look at this, you see lines and the lines are quarter inch apart when you look at this closely. It's same thing on these small branches. That's because their teeth are cutting in at a quarter inch. And again, they can even girdle these spruce trees or evergreen trees as you can see. Um, but we want to stop that. So this is the rabbit damage. And another telltale sign that it's rabbits are their droppings. Those, you know, round bees, the, you know, the green ones that they eat again and the brown ones that they won't eat again. Um, but again, the rabbit droppings are very distinct, uh, round pellets about, oh, almost five eighths in diameter up to a half inch in diameter if they're big and definitely very spherical round with no little dots on them like we see with deer droppings. Okay, one way you can do is exclude them, especially in a um, area such as a, a garden or a complete urbanized area. 
And having a fence and a one inch diameter mesh, this is half inch, but if you have one inch, and you don't have to fold it for uh, rabbits. All you have to do is go put it in the ground just four inches. Rabbits primarily do not dig more than six inches down, and they won't dig across more than four inches down. So our rabbits in Nebraska, the cottontail and the jackrabbits, um, and we're mainly talking about the cottontail here, dig a form to have babies in. They don't dig a hole. European rabbits dig a hole. So Bugs Bunny was European because he had a hole and he had a couch in there and TV and everything. Uh, but our rabbits just dig a, a slight form in the ground. Um, so a fence that's a half inch, keeping the baby rabbits out, burying the ground four inches and extending above about two foot is great. Mo hardly any rabbits can get up above two foot. So if you buy a three foot piece of hardware cloth, and you staple that to the fence, or I ran it between the um, chain link fence and the poles of the chain link fence and just ran quarter inch, excuse me, half inch mesh in there, two foot tall, and then push it in the ground in between um, the poles, rabbits could not get in and out of that type of situation. And that can go around the complete yard. And you wonder about, what about where the gate is? Well, all you have to do is put some flashing, uh, about three inch flashing on the poles of the gate or the door of the gate and where the gate closes you pour a cement slab and then as the cement is drying you open the door a couple times so it fits really tight you have less than a quarter inch space in there and nothing gets in there's a, to protect a single tree again two to three inches in the ground you want to have it two or three inches away from the tree so you don't girdle the tree, and you want it up at least 20 inches. Now, this stops most of the rabbits from chewing the base of young trees. Now, if you're a year where we get 20 inches of snow, remember, a rabbit is light, they can climb on that. So if you're expecting a lot of snow or an area that gets a lot of snow, such as in the sand hills, you may want to go up to 30 inches from the ground level. Here in the eastern part of the state, very, very seldom do we get 20 inches of snow that stays around very long. So we're okay with 20 inch up to, to solve the problem. Trapping can be done, but it must be done this time of year. Once things green up, you're not gonna trap a rabbit. Um, this time of year, they're looking for food. You can use carrots, uh, romaine lettuce, um, or anything like that. And you put the, a, a one-way door trap, so just the door on one side, put a piece of burlap over it, stick it under a tree that's low hanging or next to a deck, someplace where you see the droppings, you see the, the, the typical rabbit tracks, and then you can catch them during the winter. Now remember, if you leave them out of there overnight in a trap, they're gonna freeze to death. So be very, very cognizant. If you're putting a trap out and it's cold at night, check it every so many hours or don't leave it open when you're not gonna be able to check it because we don't want the rabbit to, to succumb from the cold weather, that's not humane. However, once the rabbit is trapped, you do not wanna relocate that rabbit or translocate it. That's against regulation, which you can do, and which is legal across the whole state. If you're outside the sea limits, you can use a firearm to dispatch the rabbit if you so wish, or the humane way to euthanize the rabbit would be to put the cage with the rabbit in it in a metal uh, trash can, a piece of dry ice, a half a cup of water, put the lid on the trash can, wait a couple hours, and the rabbit goes to sleep from the CO2 and never wakes up again. It's a very humane way of euthanization that is legal across the whole state. Now, if you don't wanna, so to speak, euthanize a rabbit, you can release it on site. You can't move it, but you can release it on site. You're saying, well, won't it come right back? The chances are, if it was in the cage for a while, at least for an hour, it, you hazed it. And there's only a 50-50 chance that rabbit will stay in your yard or come back to your yard. So if you wanna try that, you can definitely try that, and then you don't have to go to the euthanization process. As far as repellents go, um, all our university tests and university tests across the country have shown extremely little evidence of repellents working on rabbits. 
uh, whether they're sprays, blood meal, you name it, people's hair, lion's hair, zoo do, which is defecation from zoo animals, coyote urine, no. We've tested it, virtually no repellency over the long run, any time of year. So you're pretty much set on trapping or exclusion. Exclusion is actually your best. Um, it's fairly easy and it works very well. I'm gonna switch to bats now, if we don't have any questions on the rabbits. See if I have any questions coming in here. Just gonna check for questions. No, nope, I don't seem to have any questions, okay. Um, so bats, we do have 13 species of bats in the state. There's really only two that get into areas that we have to uh, consider them, so to speak, a pest. And that's the, the big brown and the small brown. Occasionally we get the red bat in homes, but that's very, very seldom. Um, our brown bats are the ones that get in homes across the whole state, especially in the eastern part of the state and the northern part of the state. Now, we do have some bats that are species of concern and are and do have some protection. But for the most part, bats have very little protection in the state of Nebraska. Um, when it, so there's several things you can do. Now, talking about that, bats are very small and most bats um, that we have, except for the red bat, only have about one young per year per female. And so their reproduction is very, very slow. And as you know, bats only eat flying insects or flying moths. So as they fly through the air, they catch their food. So bats will never go down to eat a poison bait. If it's not live, it's not moving, it's not food, they won't touch it. Okay. And there is no poison baits legally available in the whole United States for bats. Okay. So don't let anybody try to trick you and say, oh, this is a bait for bats. That's a Wait, a big misnomer, it's illegal, and it's a way to, for somebody to make money uh, by fraudulent means. Okay, the signs of bat infestation is one, seeing bats coming out of the attic. And we're mainly worried about bat infestations inside structures. We're not worried about bat infestations around homes. Now, everybody might say, oh, what about rabies? Rabies is extremely low in bats, I mean, we. I would worry more about dogs, cats, and skunks way before bats. Um, it's, you know, they can carry rabies without us knowing it. And there was something put out by the Humane Society that said this year, um, more bats were found with rabies than ever before that were in the state of Nebraska. Well, that was a very misleading statement. The reason is before April 15th of 2018, Anytime we wanted a bat tested for rabies, we had to set it, send it to the veterinary diagnostic lab at Kansas State in Manhattan, Kansas. In, in April 2018, the University of Nebraska, our new multi-million dollar veterinary diagnostic lab went online and is doing great. And so now we can test our own bats right here on campus, on East Campus. And so what they didn't tell you when they said we found more bats carrying rabies, they didn't say we tested 20 times as many bats than we ever had before in the state of Nebraska. So our percentage of bats having rabies in Nebraska is still only, it's still less than 5%. So less than 5% that we have are actually have the rabies. And bats don't act any different when they have rabies. Um, they carry it without having any kind of sign. So you can't say, well, it's flying in my house, so it must have rabies. That's a, a big myth and misnomer. Um, so seeing the bats flying, another thing. Rub marks, they leave marks where they try to get in the house. They also have noise. They have warm up laps at dusk, and you can hear them screeching. And of course, the telltale sign, like with most creatures, is their defecation. Bat guano, is what we call it, is very sparkly and it's pointed at one end. And here you can see it a little more of a close up. And if you tease it apart, you'll notice it's completely made of insect exoskeletons. So it's not like a mouse dropping or any other dropping. It's almost 100% the exoskeletons of those moths and wasps that they're feeding on. 
And so you can easily see it, and it sparkles because it's made of those exoskeletons. And that's why for years, it's not now, um, back guano was used as eyeliner and um, eyeshadow for women because it sparkles and it was used a lot um, during the 20, 1920s up to the 1940s and it gave us that saying of women batting their eyes. But again, a little trivia there for you. And if you really tease it apart, that's what it looks like. Okay, so, but because there is rabies, I do have to go through what the health department wants me to say. Now, so the vast majority of the bats are rabies free. If a bat is down, okay, and is isolated by itself, it may have a higher rate, but it has to be down on the ground, not just flying in your house, okay? If you are accidentally bitten, Definitely get the rabies shots because if you contract rabies, there's only about less than a 10% chance that you will live. So the rabies shots, I know they're expensive. I get them the preventives all the time and they've gone up in price from $200 to $1,000. Um, but that's with every medication nowadays. But if you think you're bit and you don't have the live bat in a container, um, or the bat's head's been hit. So we can't test it. If its head's been hit or smashed, okay, it's impossible to tell if it has rabies. We need a bat that's live or that its head is not damaged whatsoever and it can't be frozen. There's no way we can test it. Then you should get the rabies shots. Now, you don't have to have it, get them like within an hour. You have a day or two to get the shots if you think you're bit. Now, the bite of a bat is very insignificant. Uh, most of the time I've been bitten by them, the teeth break off in my skin. Um, they're very, very small teeth. But if you think you've been bit, or if you find a bat in your bed, and you don't know if you've been bit, and there's a chance you might have been bit, go get the shots. It's just, it's well worth the precaution. And they're not bad, they're in the arm. Um, this is a series of two or three shots, depending on what the, they're doing at that particular time but it's definitely worthwhile, okay? So again, if, if someone gets bit or you find a, a, a bat in the bedroom and you don't know if you've been bit or not, go get, contact a physician, contact the health department and get the shots. Okay, let's go to exclusion because exclusion is pretty much it for bats, okay? There's no poisoning. There's really no trapping. Um, allow that or that will work halfway decent. So we're at the point of exclusion. But to exclude them, we have to make sure they're out of the house first. So once we find a place that they're coming in and out, we have to make sure they leave. Now you're wondering, how about the babies? So we have a saying with bats, let them fly till July. Because the young of the year are with the mother from about February to May, Okay, and sometimes with some species up to the 1st of July. So even though they're born between February and May, they'll be in the attic or in the house in a nursery because a mom flies out or one mom flies out, gets feeds and then comes back and feeds a bunch of babies and they have nurseries and they do uh, group parental care. And so that's how that works. So we want it so all the bats fly out so you don't trap them in the house because that would be worse. So you wait till July, and then you can put different types of one-way devices. And the cheapest, easiest one-way device, if you know where the bats are getting in and out, you put a little piece of wood and hang some netting. I usually put fishing weights here on the end of these, and it's down. So the bats come out. Leave this for two or three nights with no lights around. They'll come out, and they'll all come out. When they come back, they hit this. They won't crawl up underneath it if it's hanging down next to the building with weights. And then they have to find a new place to live. After a week of doing that, two or three days to a week, you're pretty much sure the bats will be out of the attic. Then you can plug up all the entries and they won't get back in. Bats cannot chew through anything. They can't chew through duct tape. So no matter what you plug up the entries, you got it solved. Anything that is a nickel size slit 
okay, a quarter inch slit or round as a nickel, a bat can get through, okay? So all that needs to be sealed up. So it's really weatherproofing. Here's some of these uh, devices in action. The bat's coming out that night. They're gonna come out when they come back. They'll try to get, they'll keep, keep, keep hitting this fabric here and they won't go up underneath here. And so these, all these bats, after this night, we'll have to find a new place to live. And then this entrance and exit can be caulked up. Now, there's some places where you want to make sure you got the bats before you release them. And you can use this device. It's fairly expensive. You can buy it online. And you put this over the hole. All the bats go in. You can move the bats um, to the other side of the house or just within 100 yards of the house and release them and then patch up that area. If you find a bat in your house, first of all, it's tough to find. Usually they're behind the curtains during the day. You can chase it out. Now, the bat's gonna do in a house is gonna fly around trying to find a way out. So if you have a bat, shut the lights off on the porch because that draws insects into your house. Open the windows and doors and People would say, well, that'll let more bats in. No, it's, it's very seldom bats come in. And if one came in, it wants to get out. It's not gonna call its friends in through the open door or open windows. It's gonna try to get out. Have the lights off, stand off to the side, and the bat will try to find its way out. Now bats, just because of the way they fly, they always have to dip to the middle of the room. So if you're in the middle of the room, they're gonna dip above your head. They don't wanna be near you. They don't want to get caught in your hair. Just don't be in the middle of the room because what happens, they go, they fly, they're weak flyers towards the, the wall. They have to stop and turn around. When they stop and turn around, they lose speed and they have to dip to gather speed up to the middle of the room so they can fly better. And that's the only reason why they dip above anybody is to get the proper flight. Okay. Safe capture. Always wear a leather glove. Remember, the bats in Nebraska, their teeth cannot get through a leather glove, okay? And then I use the container method. A bat's on the wall during the day, it's gonna be pretty sessile on the wall. So what you're gonna do for that bat, you're gonna find it, and then you're gonna go up to it with a box or a cup or a container, put it over the bat, and this person should be wearing leather gloves. I couldn't find a picture of a woman doing it. So we uh, got a picture of someone without the leather gloves and we slide a piece of cardboard or paper under, and then you can just take it right outside. That bat is probably not gonna come back in your house. By being in your house, even for an hour, it is so stressed, it will always think of the indoors of your house as a place not to go. So if you get a bat and the next week you get another bat, it's a completely different bat. Okay, and you can easily release them outdoors. Now, if the bat did, and this is a red bat here that has twins and triplets, um, so it usually stays in the ground. Um, but what we can do is, if, if you think someone might have been bitten by the bat or you don't know, then you can keep the bat in the container, close the container off and bring that to the health department and they can decide whether they wanna have it tested or not. If you can bring it in to be tested, but then you will be charged. If the health department has it tested, then you personally won't be charged. There is repellents out there for bats. All the tests that I've seen show that they are, oops, they are pretty much worthless. This one is ground up mothballs. You have to put enough mothballs in your attic that you and your children will probably get sick and choke before the bats would leave. This is an ultrasound unit. Bats do not hear these things. They're not jammed by these things and they completely stay away from them. Um, and it's not gonna, I mean, they stay away from the exact unit, but they will be in the whole room. They're not hurt by the sound coming out of these items. Just, Okay, if there's no question on bass, and I don't see anything in the chat line, so we'll move on to moles. Okay, so 
Moles are probably our number one in parts of the state. Uh, we do have some areas such as Lancaster County, Nebraska, where we have very few moles. And then we have places like Kearney, uh, Hall County, and even up in Washington and Douglas County where moles are extremely prevalent. Why do some counties have moles and why do some counties do not have moles? It's the type of soil. And it's also the number of earthworms. So these, this is the Eastern mole, the only mole that we have in Nebraska. And as you can see, um, they do have eyes, they see light and dark. Their teeth are very small because they are insectivores. They eat no plant material. If they accidentally eat a plant material, it goes in one end and out the other end, just like corn with us, okay? They can't digest it. So they swim through the soil with these paws, front paws that are made to go the opposite direction so they can swim through the soil, looking for earthworms. Now, their tunnels are just under the surface of the grass, about an inch down. That's looking for food. Then they have deeper tunnels where they actually reproduce. So what you see in the lawn is where they're looking for the earthworms. And so they're not eating the grass, they're ripping the grass roots. And once you rip these roots, if it doesn't rain or you don't push them right back immediately, though that grass, that turf will die because the roots are ripped. They also will go deep. When they go deep, they cause a mound. Okay, so these mounds are from when they decide to go a foot or two deep for nesting purposes. So this is their feeding runs or their traveling runs just under the surface. This is what causes the damage. Notice there's no open holes when it comes to moles. They plug up their hole. They don't want any air getting in. They don't want any light getting in. So to know the difference between a mole hole and some of the other animals, a mole pushes the soil up with its head. And moles are fairly small, and they're only about six inches by about two to three inches in diameter, six inches long. They push it up so you get this conical pile of dirt that is right over the hole. So this hole is about two to three inches in diameter, and the amount of dirt is very chunky because they're pushing it up with their head. It's not fine, they're not carrying it up with their mouth or pushing it up with their paws. They're, they're actually pushing it up with their head. So you get this volcanic looking mound that's less than a foot in diameter. So we're talking about less than a foot from here to here and less than usually eight inches high. So less than eight inches from here to here. And that's a typical mole hill or mole mound. We don't want to mix a mole hill with anything else, okay? Okay, moles are made to live underground. They don't need much oxygen. For that reason, poison peanuts, rat poisons, won't even hardly touch them. I don't know why they sell poison peanuts for moles. It's a complete money maker because it doesn't work. Um, because their blood is made to buffer, okay? They're not a rat. Even if you put those poisons in their mouth, they spit it out. They like loose soil that's less disturbed. We don't find moles on a, on a football field in the middle of the fall because it's being trampled and it's pretty packed. They like looser soil and they like moist soil. So I always have people call me, I don't, you know, my neighbor doesn't take care of their lawn at all. They don't water it. They don't fertilize it and they don't have the moles and I take care of it. I mow it all the time. I fertilize it. I get rid of the weeds and I, um, irrigate it and I have the moles and I go yep you gave them the habitat they want you give them what they want they will be there and that's what you do I mean this is their habitat before it was your land okay it was theirs and you're making it better for them so of course they're going to gravitate to when you do things like that okay moles only reproduce once a year in May and June and that's at that deep nest that's about almost two foot down Okay, we did a study with moles, this seems things about them, and actually we looked at over a thousand moles across the whole state, all different times of year. 70% of their diet is earthworms, okay? The 30% that's not earthworms is usually insects, and, those in, and most of those insects of that 30% is ants. 
Grubs make up a very, very, very small portion of their diet. So getting rid of grubs does not get rid of the moles. Okay, another myth. Now, can you get rid of the earthworms? Why? Earthworms are great for the yard. And there is no chemical out there toxic to get rid of earthworms. There's a repellent for earthworms on the market now that has iffy things. But I can tell you high nitrogen fertilizers and some insecticides will get rid of earthworms. Can you put down the insecticide just to get rid of the earthworms? No. Okay, because it's not on the label. Now, they're going to forage a lot looking for these earthworms. They'll forage 50 to 75 feet, these surface runs, per night. Okay, they do most of their searching in the dawn or dusk. They do sometimes search during the day, especially if it's not really hot and dry or after a rain. But most of the time, and so these runs are the ones that are causing you the damage in the turf because they're ripping the roots. Remember, they're not eating the roots. They're just ripping them looking for these guys. They can go pretty fast. They can, they can hardly travel on the ground on the surface, but as they're swimming through the soil, they can swim through easily. Once they've been through the once through that tunnel, they'll go 80 foot a minute. That's pretty fast. I know I chased them down, watching them and trying to stab them. I couldn't get to them. Now moles don't, you may not have a lot of moles in your yard, even though you have a lot of tunnels. Because the territory of a male is three acres, the territory of a female, her whole home range, is only two thirds of an acre. But if you're, if you're going 50 to 75 feet a night, it looks like you have the whole mole nation in your yard. You probably only have one or two. Because you probably only have one or two in your yard, we can go to fairly easy management tactics. Okay, so let's think about the different ways, modification soil condition. Well, if the soil is hard and you want it hard, that would stop them and you don't have any shaded areas. But most of the time, if you want good turf, you don't want it hard and you want it somewhat uh, moist. However, if you go with a type of ground cover or a turf that has a very thick root, when they're swimming through looking for the earthworms, they won't harm it. So if moles are in an area where you have a ground cover, like ivy, they're just aerating it for you. They're not gonna hurt those big thick roots. They're not causing any problem. They're just doing aeration. They don't eat any bulbs. Remember, all they eat is earthworms. They're not after any plant material, okay? So you can, if you have an area you really don't want them, you can use packed gravel and clay. They stay away from that. Can you put a fence to keep them out of your yard? Well, it's not really feasible. You would have, the fence would have to go in the ground almost three foot, so I'd say it's not feasible. Can you reduce their food supply? No, that's not their food supply. Can you use a natural predator? Well, I wish it would work, but it doesn't work that well and people don't wanna do it. The, their biggest predators are coyotes, which are not in the city limits, and usually there's a few here and there, and just like dogs and cats, when they dig up the mole to eat the mole, they do more damage than the actual uh, mole is doing. So yeah, you can use dogs and sometimes cats. Cats aren't as good at digging them up, but coyotes and dogs are fairly good at digging up moles. But I can tell you the damage that a, a dog does looking for the moles is probably gonna be a lot worse than your uh, mole damage. There is a lot of repellents on the market for moles, um, and they have different degrees, and they, they come different types of repellents. One is a vibration device. This one, you know, you can use the heavy-duty vibration device pictured here, or you can use a thing like the daisy that's supposed to put vibrations. Now, moles don't like a lot of vibration. You won't, like I said, they don't like a lot of disturbance. But the way they find their earthworm food is by the little vibrations and the smell of the earthworm. So one of the devices you put in the ground, it's only gonna vibrate the soil heavily about maybe six inches radius around the device. After six inches radius, the vibration is gonna be low. And the mole is gonna think that's an earthworm. It's gonna be attracted to it, okay? 
So unless you put one of these every square foot in the whole lawn with very good batteries, it's not going to work to keep the moles out. We do have um, different types of olfaction repellents, such as things like Mole Med, which is castor oil. You can make this yourself. It's in my NEV guide. You mix one ounce of unrefined castor oil to buy from the pharmacy, okay, with into one gallon of water with one tablespoon, a tablespoon of a surfactant, not a detergent, but a soap, like ivory soap, something as a spreader. When you shake that and mix that gallon, that's the same thing you're buying here. Okay, now you in turn mix this product or what you just made with the one ounce of castor oil and the one gallon of water with the one tablespoon of um, surfactant or soap. You mix that again, about one ounce per gallon of solution to spread it. And one ounce in a gallon of that mixture or this goes over about 300 square foot. Okay, one gallon will cover 300 square foot of that solution. And that'll last maybe a week and only be about 25% effective. Whether it's the one you buy or the one you make, you're gonna get the same, same effectiveness. I don't care how many months they say on the label, that has not been proven, we cannot repeat that. I have not been able to repeat that in the field. Okay. Besides the repellents, we can trap them. And there's several types of trap. There's lethal traps. Pretty much all the traps are lethal, but there's one way you can do it that's non-lethal. A non-lethal trap would be to dig a hole along the run. So you have an active run. You dig a hole and set a five-gallon drywall bucket about two inches below the soil. So the run goes right over it. Put a piece of plywood or board that's about a foot square over the bucket, completely covering the bucket, and the run will go, it'll be covering the run or where the run was. The mole comes along, starting to reopen that run, he's going pretty fast, and since the bucket is set in about two inches into the ground, boop, he falls in the bucket. And if it's a five gallon bucket, he can't get out. And you have a live mole in the bucket, okay? He's live, he's fine, and he's in the bucket. That's all I'm gonna say about that. So you have him and he's in the bucket. Um, if you want the mole gone, you can use some of these traps. And there's many out there in the market today. There's a harpoon mole trap. There's this one choker trap that goes in. This one is on set on the surface down into the run. This one you have to dig and place it in the run. With any of these traps, including the bucket. What you're gonna do is find these runs and you're gonna step down these runs the night before because the runs are already appeared. The run that reappears the next morning is the one the next night you're gonna put the trap on. If it reappears once, they'll probably use it over and over again. If it doesn't reappear a second time, they're not gonna go, they went through that and they didn't find any earthworms, it's not a place they wanna be, and they probably will never use it again. Pack that one down, water it, so the roots of the grass can reattach. These ones that they're opening up over and over again is where you can set your traps or buckets. And I can have little points where you would do that. Not near the mounds, because the mounds, they're deep, okay? These are gonna be on the ridges, or tunnels there. And these traps, and there's several on the market, there's five or six different types, especially ones, the harpoon mole trap, test it in location two or three times before setting it. And what you're gonna do, you're not gonna step over the traps the second time, oh, excuse me, the runs the second time. You're just gonna push it down about the thickness of your hand. And that's where you put the trap. On top, they'll stab down in, because you don't wanna push the whole thing down. And same thing with you bury the bucket. You just push it down a foot on each side. You don't know which way he's coming, okay? And he'll fall in the bucket. You don't push it all down because that makes that slows him down. And you want him to go 
going, you want them to be going fast to fall in the bucket or to get hit by the trap. Okay, there's also toxicants we can use, and there's actually a fumigant. Now, there's a lot of fumigants on the market. The one, like these, the gas bombs, don't work. The only way they work, if we put a mole in a five gallon aquarium, no, excuse me, 10 gallon aquarium, not even a 20 gallon aquarium, we put one of these bombs in the aquarium and we put a glass lid on, then it chokes them after about an hour. Remember, their blood is buffered. They don't need much oxygen. Okay, I just got a question I can answer. Do you just spray the mole spray on the grass? Yes, but you have to cover the whole lawn. You can't just go around the outside. So if you're doing the repellent spray, we had a question from Gage County, you you're going to spray the whole lawn where you don't want the mole, not just around the edges, because they'll go fast through that. But if it's there, and remember you gotta spray it every week almost, or if it rains even more, you have to spray that castor oil around. And just a hint while we're talking about the castor oil, they do make the castor oil as a granular. We found no effect with that. It doesn't work. The castor oil is too adhered to the granular, which is usually clay, and it doesn't stop them. So that you have to go with the liquid and get it in with the, with the, the concentrate one ounce per gallon of water, okay? Spread over 300 square feet, not more than 300 square foot. Okay, back to the gases. So these gases won't work for moles. Now there is a gas called phostoxin that will work for mole. It's odorless to them and kills them in 20 seconds. However, this is a restricted use chemical and it does kill people. In fact, this cannot be used within 50 foot of a dwelling because there's been times when people put it in their yard or professionals put it in the yard and it got, it went through the tunnel, got close, and this happened in Utah 10 years ago. It snuck into a foundation and killed two young girls who were sleeping in a bedroom in the basement. So this cannot be used within 50 foot of a dwelling in any way or form, and it must be used only by a licensed person. And these tablets go into the tunnel, one every 20 foot, and this gas will kill them but here you have to hire someone to do it. Okay. These ones, the sulfur gas, we'll just chase them and they'll block up the hole. They don't care. Now, there is a bait out there and there's a lot of baits that don't work. If it's a poison peanut, remember it doesn't work. I can shove a poison peanut in a mole's mouth and it'll spit it out or it'll go in one end and out the other, okay? But Bell Labs, made a special matrix that's made to kill moles. And they put it in a gummy worm like this that smells and tastes like a earthworm. The only thing it doesn't have is the vibration. So if you get one of these gummy worms, stick it in the tunnel and put one of those daisies next to it or vibration device, the mole's gonna be there looking for food. Now, do not cut these. The poison's only in the citella. That's where the reproductive part of the fake worm, and that's where the mole's gonna bite it. The mole's gonna feel it, and feel that it's a worm, and bite into that area. That's the only area that has the poison. And so you can, this is for the professional talparid, the exact same formula, the exact same thing is sold for the homeowners as Tomcat Mole Killer by the same company. Okay, so these two products, the professional one and the homeowner are identical, okay? Now, we find out that this one works better because the people, the, the professional people, read the directions and follow it exactly. The homeowner does not. So, if you want it to work, and you wanna do it yourself, follow the directions exactly. Okay, wear the latex gloves. So you don't put your scent on the earthworm scent. Make one little hole, do not cut these. Do not let them get warm. If they're put in a car or they're allowed to get the sun on them and get hot, they're no good. If they freeze, they're no good. If you open the package, it's sealed, and, you, and it was more, it's more than a week since you opened the package, they dry out, they're no good. 
So once you open that package, you have to use all 10 of them, even though they may be $2 a piece when you buy them. You have to use them all that week once you open that package. You can't freeze them. Don't let them out in the sunlight. And then they're pushed down into the burrow with a latex glove or nitro glove. And then you're going to cover that hole up. And you only can put one every 16 to 20 foot along the active runs. Now these are made so that if a child or a bird accidentally grabs it, they'll spit it out. They have a chemical in there called bitrin that the mole cannot sense, but ma other mammals like ourselves and birds can sense it. And here's the mole chewing on the citella right there because it feels that reproductive point on that worm. And he, know, and he doesn't know it, but the poison's there. Okay, do we have any more questions on moles? Now there is there's always wannabes. Chewing gum just gives the mole fresh breath. Okay, these big daisies, not enough vibration. Cat litter just stinks up your yard and gives kids toxemia. Uh, so don't worry about, don't put cat litter in the yard. That's not gonna really do anything. And these big vibration devices you can make yourself. We haven't tested them. We talked to some people that used them and they said, oh no, we haven't found any moles in our yard. So who knows if they work or not. There's no other, if there's no, I see no more questions on moles, we'll go on. Keep it going here. Dennis, do you want to take a 10 minute break to get a drink? Yeah, we can take it now. I was going to wait. So after pocket goes, we can take it now. Oh, we got a question. Let's, I'll answer the mole question, then we'll take a break. How's that? Sounds good. When you're finished with moles, could you discuss opossums coming up a sewer? Sure, I can do opossums when we come back from break before we go to um, uh, pocket gophers. Okay. So let's take a 10 minute break. I have that it's uh, right at 7.30. So at 7.40, we'll get started again. How's that sound? Or you wanna go to 7.45? Nope, 7.40 is good. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. I'm gonna pause you. Okay. Seats. So Dennis, it's all back to you now. Okay, what I'm gonna do is answer a couple questions before we go to our opossum question. Uh, the first question from campus is, can you flood the tunnels to get rid of moles? The answer is no. They swim quite well. In fact, their scientific name is Scaphiophis aquaticus. They're great swimmers. So you, you're, you'll, you'll flood your house and probably flood your basement before you get rid of the moles. And don't use the exhaust of your car. Uh, one, you can put carbon monoxide in your basement because of cracks and seams. It's not gonna control the moles whatsoever. And you could light your yard on fire. So don't use a car exhaust and don't use water for moles. Another question coming in from Kelly Feehan in Platte County. Um, how do you get rid of or control hawks? The legal answer is you don't. Hawks are completely protected. They were here before us and everything they do is beneficial. Um, so there is no legal way to get rid of hawks and you're not even supposed to, so to speak, haze them or put repellents out for hawks. Okay. Um, if Kelly wants to say what the problem is, what kind of problem are they possibly causing? I can't really don't think of a problem they can cause. They may go after your pet snake, but just keep your snake in tall grass. Um, so, okay, so hawks are protected, and so we'll go to our opossum now. So opossums are our only marsupial in Nebraska, and the thing is, they don't carry rabies, hardly, because um, they're a marsupial. They only eat garbage. They don't fight back. I mean, if a chihuahua went up to an opossum, it would growl, open its mouth, drool, and then roll over and play dead. Uh, every time I capture them, I capture them barehanded, not that you should do that. And they just, you know, growl and hiss and open their mouths, show me their teeth, and I count their teeth, and then they get upset and play dead. Um, 
so the question is, when it comes to opossums, is um, coming up the sewers. Now, I'm, I'm thinking that we're talking about the storm sewers in a residential area, not the, the sanitary sewers, because if they're coming up your sanitary sewer, up your stool, that's a big problem. That means you have a break somewhere between your septic system and your lagoon and your house. Um, and I would look for that problem. But if they're living in the sewers, which a lot of them do, um, the only, if you don't want them, and I would say uh, the reason why um, you, you may not want them is that if you have a horse barn, because they, the thing that they do carry, it, it grows in their defecation, is a disease that grows, a fungal disease that grows in their defecation when they defecate on straw that can cause mares to abort and can also kill foals. So you don't want opossums in a horse barn. Uh, other than that, they don't cause much problems. They do dig holes, but if they're digging holes around the house, you can live trap them. They're pretty easy to live trap. They like garbage. So you just put a live trap out, a cage trap, you open the hole and you know open one end only, and you put just garbage in there almost, and they usually go for it pretty easily. And then one thing about opossums, they're nomadic, so they're they're one of these ones that you can go down the street and let them go, and they probably won't figure out how to get back. Um, they're very nomadic type animal, and they don't stay around one place very often unless they were born there. Um, and so that's the way to get rid of opossums. So pretty much a cage like this. And you, with the opossum, you could use a two end. Most of them, we don't use a two end. I would put a, you don't even have to put a piece of burlap over it with an opossum. And you don't wanna put anything like tuna fish or eggs in there, because then you'll get a, either a, a raccoon or cat or a skunk. But more like rotting vegetables and, uh, Things of that sort is what they like to go after. Even, you know, corn on the cob, but you might get a squirrel with corn on the cob um, in there. But I've, I found opossums very easy to capture uh, that way. So let me go to these two questions here. Okay, back to Kelly's. How to get rid of hawks? Oh, here we go. Hawks are killing rabbits and squirrels and pheasants in town. Well, that's their job and that's their function in the ecosystem is to eat rabbits and squirrels. The pheasants, which are imported invasive species, I wish they eat more pheasants. Um, so that's all good. I can't see anything wrong with that. That's their job and they're doing their job. I say power to those hawks. Um, you know, what else can you say? That's part of the ecosystem. It's the way it's supposed to be. We don't want to throw it off balance now. We do enough of that. Um, okay, another question here. I think Okay, I, I don't understand one of the questions that just came in. It says, I think the force. I think this is your possum. Oh. Possum. He was living in the wood pile. Okay. He was fierce. Well, see. I've caught somebody, I, I, I've never thought of a possum be fierce. Yes, they're gonna growl because they're defensive. And if you get towards them, they're gonna open their mouth, they're gonna growl at you. They don't carry rabies, so they don't have rabies. And they just are scared. And every time I've seen them with their mouth open, hissing and growling and drooling at me, I just walk right up and grab them, look them in the face, and they get scared and they roll over and play dead. I mean, they don't, they don't fight back. I mean, they wouldn't fight back a cat or a chihuahua. Unlike a raccoon, they'll kill both of those. So um, I don't know what the fierce part is. I think they may, they may appear fierce to you because you're unaware of their habits. Um, but the way to move them, you can, you know, if you don't want to do it with gloves, have them go in the live trap and move the live trap. Okay, so we'll go back to our pocket gophers if there's no other questions. Or if there's anything someone really wants to, me to cover right away, just chat in and we'll do that. So I think we were at Pocket Gophers. Okay, 
So pocket gophers are herbivores. These are ones that eat bulbs. These are ones that eat iris roots. These are the ones that eats the roots of fruit trees. Um, they could take out a whole orchard of fruit trees over a winter. Um, so one question came in about the opossums from Jennifer. What is the relocation or translocation rule? Relocation is putting it right back in the same place. Translocation is moving it to another place. So you can relocate, put it right back, any animal. You can't translocate any fur bearing animal in the state of Nebraska. Um, and so you're not supposed to translocate opossums but that's primarily because when they made the law, they wanted to make it wide, not to confuse people. Biologically, it's okay to translocate them. Um, but if you move them up to 100 yards, which is the, still in the legal parameters, they probably won't come back. So the rule is you, you're not supposed to translocate them more than 100 yards. Um, and so that's the law in the books. Biologically, you can move them 50 yards and they probably won't figure their way back. You can move them 200 yards and they'll probably be okay, unlike most of the other animals. Okay, to the pocket gophers. Pocket gophers are much bigger, besides being a herbivore, um, and they dig and they stay on the ground, no open holes, just like the mole. They're called pocket gophers because they can put their skin behind their teeth so they can chew roots without the dirt going down their throat. And so they have these two pockets that I'm showing here. They have these big claws for digging so they have a hard time running on the surface. And their mounds are completely different than a mole mound. So their mounds are over two foot in diameter. They're fan shaped and they're very fine dirt because they, uh, do it with their paws and then they put it in their mouth and they push it up and they do like a dog and, and put it up and they their tunnels here are three inches not two inches and you got to remember this is at a 45 degree angle to the side and to the surface so this is the plug and so the hole is that oops, go back one the hole is going this way oh, excuse me the hole going this way because this is a dirt so the dirt has been pushed out this way, as you can see here. So if you pick up this dirt and just pack this back in and put seed here after they're gone or gravel, pack gravel in here down to this point, this is about 18 inches. Because usually when I put my arm down there, my elbow is here and my fingers are feeling this. And if you do that, they run the other way. They don't come up and bite your fingers. Um, but that'll stop them from killing the grass in this area if you get rid of this. Okay, so if you look from above, that's what this A is, you see you have all these mounds. The main tunnel is not below the mounds. It's a 45 degree angle and off to the side. So this is a cross section. So you have these main runs, they're about almost a foot down and then two foot down, you have the nesting site. This C is cache. That's where they keep their food. And they do this one here is a latrine, so they all poop in the same place. The funny part is that every once in a while, they empty this, and you see a big pile of gopher, pocket gopher poop on the surface. I was always wondering, how do they decide which gopher empties a latrine? Is it the youngest male? Is it the one that left the hole open? No, it's a good master's thesis. Which gopher in this society? Because these things, they'll, they'll be, gophers will have, you know, two to 300 in a big colony, um, small families of a dozen, and they can take up several acres. And so they're, they're active year round. And so they have these big mounds. So all these holes are covered with mounds. To stop them, there's several ways you can do it. Trapping is one way, especially if there's only a couple and it's in a residential lawn. And these Maccabee traps work very well. Um, what happens, you have to put two, and you have to put them in the main tunnel. And when their nose hits this, these things pierce right where their lungs are and, and kill them. Um, and so one has to go in each direction. You don't wanna do it like this. This is what not to do, because they, they'll just push dirt out this way. So you dig into the main tunnel, 
and you still have to patch this up so no lights coming down with dirt but well, you don't want the dirt to go into this so you usually use a wad of paper and you have and the reason why these are tied in because they don't drag these off by accident so if they're coming this way they hit this one and get pinched if they're coming this way they hit this one and get pitched and then if you want to trap them the Maccabee trap works the best you could there's a lot of uh, over-the-counter poisons and since these are herbivores poison peanuts work for moles I'm um, excuse me pocket gophers doesn't work for moles works for pocket gophers you you can dig into the main tunnel so this is you can dig out what they plugged and you spoon in the poison in the main tunnel and then you plug this back up you don't put any poison in this thing that goes to the surface okay it has to be down in this main run with no dirt on it. Or they'll just, if you put it here, they'll put dirt in front of their face and push it right, at, push the poison right to the surface and then you get non-target poisoning. They have a device which intersects the main tunnel, as shown here, and you can use that hopper or you can just dig a hole with a T-rod and spoon it into the main tunnel and the plug up. But remember, the main tunnel is not in between the mounds, it's off, 45 degree angle from the mounds. And they and for big fields, they actually have a hopper that fits on a three point hitch on a tractor and you intersect these main and it drops them into the main one. And the main chemical is zinc phosphide, but there's several poison peanuts on the market that work very well. Now, if you have an alfalfa field, you can't harvest the alfalfa for so many days after you apply the poison and those number of days is on the label because it changes with the different poisons so read the label always read the label when you buy the product read the label before you break it open read the label when you use the product and read the label to get rid of the container of the product so if you don't read the label completely four times you're not doing it right read the label read the label read the label that's all I can say. And it is a federal offense not to read the label or to um, not follow the label exactly. It's not just a misdemeanor, it's a federal offense on a pesticide. Okay, we're gonna move on to voles unless we have a question. And let's see, we have a question there, okay. So voles, voles are, a lot of people think they're mice, they're not, they're a completely different animal, uh, but they look somewhat like mice to the lay person. The difference is that their ears are really low and tucked into their body, and their tail is really short. Notice how short that tail is. And their, their nose is kind of a bit blunt, unlike a mouse. Um, we do have three types of voles in the state of Nebraska, the prairie vole, which is statewide, the meadow vole, which is statewide. And you probably won't be able to tell the difference between these two. And then we have one that we hardly find, and it's only in the wooded areas of the southeast corner of the state, like Richardson County, Nemaha County, Indian Cave State Park, and that's the pine vole, but you won't see those. Fortunately, the way we take care of these two that are statewide is exactly the same, so you don't need to tell those two apart. As you can see, they're kind of grisly looking. You see, this is my hands. You can see how big they are in the hand. And they have these eyes. And what they do is they're on the surface and they live open holes. So they're not eating the roots. They're granivores and they eat the crown of the grass. So what they do is they go through and they eat the crown of the grass right down to the surface of the grass. Unlike a mole, they're not under the crown eating the roots or ripping the roots. They're on the surface. So you see these paths on the surface. Now, when the grass is actively growing in the summer, these paths grow in and you don't see these paths unless you really, really look for them. You usually see the holes they leave, okay? Now, they work year round under the snow. And so this is one I took on campus and they're under the snow cover. And then when the snow melts, you see this in the yard. This is because they got the thatch pushed aside under the snow and they ate the little bit of grass that was left in the winter 
down to the crown. And this will probably come back in, unless it's really extensive. Um, once the grass starts actually growing in the spring, you won't see this anymore. Just rake this out, put a little, you know, maybe a little added seed, aerate it, and the grass will be back. Um, but if you want to take care of them in the winter, you can easily take care of them by trapping them in this type situation because this is where they're really active and they're really hungry is in the winter. And we see most of these, this type thing around where there's seed, um, whether it's bird seed or just natural seed on the surface. One of the big damaging things they do is that they girdle the tree to get moisture in um, the canyon to get not only moisture, but also some starches. And you're wondering, how does a little vole get this high? Well, what happened, the snow might have been this high. So what we want to do is protect the tree so they can't do it. And how do we know this is not a rabbit? The teeth mark are only a sixteenth of an inch wide. So the little lines are a sixteenth of an inch wide, not a quarter inch like a rabbit. Habitat modification, if you have a gravel and around the trees or mulch around the trees, they're less likely to have them. If there's places where they can hide from cats and hawks, like this place does not, this place does, they're more likely to be at a place like this. This is ivy, it's supposed to be ivy. Of course, if you have a lot of bird feed falling, that also attracts them to the area. And it also track opossums that we're talking about. They go after bird feed as well. And we need to protect these trees a foot up and bury it down to the ground where it'll freeze. Now, if you put a lot of mulch, which is great for the tree, make sure you push the mulch Back from the oops, back from the tree, and push this down into the mulch. Now you only need to leave this to stop voles during the winter. Put it in on October, take it off in April. That way, it's not there to girdle the trees year round, because the the, the voles are not going to girdle the trees when there's active stuff growing in actual seeds. They're going to go for the crown, the grass from April to October. It's from October to April that they cause problem with trees. Now, if you have a big nursery, and you wanna stop them, you have to do something like this with a quarter inch mesh tied on the other, buried in with gravel against it so they don't burrow across. Now, there is some repellents out there. They're fairly expensive and they, and they don't work that well at all. All the repellents we tested, um, for voles don't seem to be given a lot of, and there's a new one on the market that we just tested and we didn't get much results on it. I didn't put it in there because I can't remember the name, uh, but we had very, very little results in our trials on repellents for voles. So let's go to trapping the voles. And just a handy thing about trapping these animals, I probably should have put in a little ahead of time, always wear gloves and it's good, especially with any mouse creature, to wear a respiratory mask, like a dust mask, so you don't get the particles from their defecation airborne and you don't breathe those in. Um, and this is also goes when cleaning up. If you're cleaning up after any mouse or bat, do not sweep, do not vacuum, always clean up wet because the diseases we get from mice and bats are airborne from a fungus that grows in the defecation. And that's what can give us things like Hanta pulmonary syndrome and other things. So never clean up any mouse droppings or bat droppings with a vacuum or broom. You spray it wet, have gloves on, clean it up with a sponge or wet cloth, and then discard those items. Or you can spray it with a disinfectant, and then it's even better, and clean it up with a sponge and wash those things with disinfectants. Okay, and it's always good to wear a dust mask, to protect yourself, and wear some kind of rubber gloves or latex gloves or late, um, nitro gloves when you're cleaning up mouse droppings. Just too many people use vacuums for droppings, and it's probably the worst thing you can do for your health. Okay, so trapping them. With the voles, just a simple trap like this, and I use just peanut butter with seed, and remember, you want to have it so it snaps towards this because they're running on the run. 
oh, some food. They put their head up there and snap, okay? Perpendicular to the run. Peanut butter, bird seed, molasses, great bait for voles. So you can use this type of trap. Now, if there's a lot of voles, okay, you can use these traps. And I, these traps hold up to 15 voles. And I usually get none or I put it in the right place and I get five or six or night. Voles are microtene rodents, like lemons, okay? Their population will go from 25 per acre all the way up to 250 per acre, and then they'll crash on their own, okay? We used to have that myth that lemons used to run into the sea. That's a big myth. They're microtene rodent. Their population normally goes up and crashes on its own. They don't kill themselves. It's just what their populations do, okay? So, again, these you don't have to put any bait in. You can put a little bird seed or grass seed around it. You nestle it right in the ground, and dogs and cats and no other animal can get in here. The, the vole walks in there out of curiosity, and it flips it into a chamber, and it's alive. So voles, there's no regulation. On the mice, there's no regulation. You can move them as far as you want. You can feed them to Kelly's hawk, or this, these things are made out of aluminum with holes in a handle, and the reason they're done that way, if you want to euthanize the, the mice, you can put this entire bucket into a bucket of water, the entire cage into a bucket of water. It's made out of aluminum, and then they, they will be euthanized with the water very quickly. And so, again, the catch-all traps or tin cats, these are what they call box traps, are, I think are number one for catching voles. To me, they work so slick and they seem to work very well. You wind them up, don't wind them up too much, and they'll catch up to 15 voles in a night. And I, we got some questions coming in, but I'm gonna finish the, the voles. We try fumigants, we had, because they have such a high system and you can't drown them. Their system is made to go through floods, big floods. So the vole system has avenues where it shunts the water away. It will also shunt the gas away, and they have open holes. So fumigates do not work on voles. And before we go deer mice, I'll look at our questions. Our, well, it looks like we only have one. The question is, we use sweet potato vines as a uh, trap plant. Voles love them. Yes, they love tubers. So besides the pocket gophers, tubers uh, are another food. So if you're getting a whole bulb or a whole potato or sweet potato eaten underground and taken underground, that's a pocket gopher. If there's bites out of your tubers, like your sweet potato, your iris bulbs, your tulip bulbs, that's a vole, not a mole, a vole with a V. These are the herbivores, okay? So you wanna go after them. They will also, <coughs> excuse me, go after the roots of vegetables, um, um, fruit trees, especially the pocket gophers, because those are very vascular. Let me take a drink here real quickly. <clears throat> Is there any way, next question from Elizabeth Killinger or from Hall County. Um, Is there any way to encourage bats to go into a bad house? It's tough. Um, the best way to do it is to make sure it's tight, bad house, in a one chamber. For Nebraska bats, go to our website, wildlife.unl.edu, and you have a house that you could design for Nebraska bats that I made up and put up there. Stephen Van Tassel and I did a NEB guide on that. It's under conservation, not under damage. So go to the website. Instead of going to damage control, go to conservation. There's four tags, disease, damage, Identification, conservation. If you go to the conservation, I'll give you the bat neb guide, bat house neb guide, excuse me. Way I found is to have them facing south on a building, not a tree. The reason is cats can climb trees and predators can climb trees, hawks can be in trees. You put it on a building facing south, don't paint it. If you're gonna have to make it a stain it a certain color, Use a non-toxic stain and make it a dark color. About 12 feet up, 12 to 20 feet above ground level where the house should be. And rub bat droppings on the bottom of the house. 
okay, with a glove. There's all the bat droppings from getting from someplace. Um, there's a lot of places you can find bat droppings. Um, and that helps sometimes if you have the right species. But it's, it's a lot of guesswork um, to get bats. Um, out of all the houses I put up, I've only found them in one house that I put up. So it takes a while. It may take two or three years before they find it. They have more chance of finding it if you had them in your attic and you got droppings from your attic and you excluded them in July and you rub those droppings from your attic on the, on the bad house outside of your house, then you have a good chance of getting them. The, probably the best way to encourage them. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So we'll go on to deer mice and field mice. These guys are a bit different. We have a white belly. We have the ears that stick up. We have a long tail. And the belly doesn't have to be white, that white, but the tail has to be bicolored, which means the top of the tail is a different color than the bottom. Here we have a, a black stripe on the tail, but the tail is lighter colored. Deer mice is the one that we worry about when we talk about hantavirus. It's the only rodent that we have found to carry hantavirus in the state of Nebraska, and that's the deer mouse. So you definitely want to keep these guys, uh, when you clean up their droppings, you want to make sure that you do it wet. Um, one thing about these guys, they climb. Unlike voles that burrow, these guys are the ones that get into a barn and they, they set up nests in your car that you haven't used or your RV. They also get into horse blankets and things like that in a barn. They, they can get into homes, unlike voles who don't want to be in the home. The deer mice and house mice like to be in a home. And these guys don't always come in at the ground level. They might seek their way to the ground level once they get in the house. But I found many cases where they dropped from trees, found a way to get into the attic, and they went down a plumbing wall to the basement and start nesting in the basement. But they enter the house at the attic level. They're great climbers. They'll climb right up siding, climb right up the bricks. There's several ways to get rid of them. Uh, you can use the multi-traps. Okay, when it comes to bait, there's a lot of baits out there. I don't recommend poison baits in the interior of a house. Here's the reason why. There is no bait that will kill a mouse quicker than five days. I don't care what the label says. There is no bait on the market for anybody that will kill the mouse quicker than five days. The mouse does not go outside. The mouse's blood pressure drops and it wants water. If it can find water in the house, a swimming pipe, under a frost free refrigerator, under a sink, it will go for the water there. It's not gonna go outside just because it's thirsty if it can find water in the house. And then it's liable to die in the wall. If it dies in the wall, it'll smell for a few days, okay? There's no poison that dries up the body. It just makes the body bleed internally, okay? Then the rotting body for the next six months will attract bacteria and fly larvae. So, and then you'll have to open up the wall to get that carcass out because there's no way you can make sure it dies where you want it to die. So I completely against using poisons, toxicants for mice within the confines of a house or structure. You can't use poisons in a commercial kitchen and you should not use poisons in a residential kitchen. The other reason why I don't suggest poisons inside a home is that the number one Poisoning of children in the United States is children getting into mouse or rat poisons. So safety-wise, I discourage it. And the other reason is I find it much more efficient to trap and catch them in the glue traps or snap traps and get twice as many than the poison can get. And I know I got them. I have the carcass. I can, discard, I can get rid of the carcass immediately. And a poison, it's a slow agonizing death. The snap trap, immediate. The glue trap, four to five hours is the average to death. So it's not immediate, but it's not five days like the poisons. So humane wise, snap traps number one, glue boards number two, poison the least humane 
in killing the mouse. Okay. Now, when we're using any of these devices for, for mice or rats, and they make glue board all sizes for rats or mice or whatever in traps, we want to remember a couple, whoop, a couple of things. I, that you want these traps, if you're using the snap traps, against the wall or the glue traps against the wall. And you want them so they, they snap to the wall. So you put them perpendicular to the wall, so the wall runs like this, and you put the bait there. Now, what to use for bait for mice? If it's the deer mice, you want to use grains, not cheese, okay? Grain products, like the voles, molasses, or peanut butter mixed with oats, something along those lines. If it's house mice you have, you want to use what they're feeding on. Once a house mouse finds something, it wants more of that. They become habituated. So if they're stealing your chocolate, use chocolate. If they're stealing your fruit, use fruit. If they're stealing your pineapple, use pineapple. Whatever they're getting into in the house, use that product for the house mouse. For the deer mice, use the grains, okay? Now, there's a lot of things out there besides the glue boards and other traps. We tested these, and these are, we have pictures of mice nesting in these things. None of these ultrasound units showed any effectiveness. Mice hardly hear ultrasound. And if they do, they become habituated to it. Cab Fresh, um, uh, question here, do Cab Fresh repel keep mice away? So there's, some, there's a lot of different things that work on some mice and don't work on others. I have found very few repellents for mice. Some people swear by peppermint or spearmint oil. Other people say uh, uh, fresh, certain fresheners that they use in their vehicle keep them away. And I think it all depends on that particular mice, mouse or population or species. One thing we know with any olfaction repellent or smell repellent, if they really want to be there, if there's no alternative place to go and live, it doesn't matter what it smells like. However, if the car or area has the smell of a fabric softener and this other place doesn't, they'll pick the one without the fabric softener, okay? Because they have an alternative, okay? Same thing with food. If you put spearmint on their food and no spearmint on this food, they'll pick this, the food with no spearmint. However, if the only food that they can use to survive on has spearmint, they'll learn to get around the spearmint, okay? It, it's just like us. If we really want something, we'll get around the pain, right? How many hangovers have you had and you still go out and drink, right? You would think one time would teach us? No, we want to drink. So we get more hangovers. These animals are the same way, or even more, because it's survival. Okay, we're going to go on to uh, dirt and land ground swirls. These guys are true hibernators. They have an open hole, and they put the dirt in their mouth, and they spread it around. But they're the only one we're coming up to that you can force them out with water because they have a simple system. It's a hole, like there, about the size of a half dollar. It goes down, and then 20 feet later, it comes up. And then in between, about a foot down or two foot down, there's a small chamber where they live, the, a, a male or a female with the young, and that's it. So if you pour water down this hole, they have to drown or come up this hole. So these are the only ones that you can use water with. Because of that, they're really easy to capture. You can make this device, and it's in the net guide. It's just quarter-inch hardware cloth, a one-foot piece by two foot long, and you bend it. Three inches, three inches, three inches, three inches. Use baling wire, and then you make a one-way door. So you make a door out of the baling wire, and you just put this over top the hole and pour water down the other hole. He runs up, his head pushes this up, and then he tries to get back out and he's standing on this. So you got him caught. Another thing that I work 
a friend of mine in Michigan told me to do this and I did it on a golf course and I caught, um, in one hour, I caught nine 13 line ground swirls off a golf course, just using this thing. And you get a milk jug, or actually you get two milk jugs, empty milk jugs, gallon milk jugs. You fill the milk jugs with water. And then you find the two holes. And if you don't know where the holes are, you pour water down one hole and you see them run up the other hole and you flag that hole and come back a half hour later. Then what you do is you invert the milk jugs, one on each hole. You do one and run over and do the other. And so the water is blubbing down and it's amazing that this orifice here of a gallon milk jug almost screws right into a 13 line ground squirrel hole. It fits perfectly. And the water's juggling down in both holes and he's got to come up or he drowns. And he's wet and he's slimy. And he pops up into one of these milk jugs. And you run over there, pick up the milk jug, put the lid back on, and you got your 13 line ground ground squirrel in the milk jug. What you do with them is up to you. I do know, and I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you bring it back to the grocery store, and put a little milk in there and say, look what I found, sometimes they give you a year's worth of milk free. Okay. I didn't say that, did I? Okay, there's nothing about 13 line ground squirrels. And 13 line ground squirrels, what they damage they do is they love seed material. They take flowers. They love flowers. They will also take, they'll take the skin off of products in the in the vegetable garden. They'll chip on pumpkins, zucchinis. Um, they'll they'll reach up and take just a little bite out of the bottom of each, each ripe tomato. And they know to do that. I think they're on uh, Snapchat, or they used to be on Facebook, because if you tell your, your friends that, oh, my tomatoes are going to be ready tomorrow, they know that. And they go in that night before, you go out there, and they take one bite of each tomato as it's just ready. So that's one of the reasons why the 13 line ground squirrels are causing some problems for us. Okay, I'm going to go on to tree squirrels now. We have one type of tree squirrel in the state of Nebraska, and that's the fox squirrel. And some are lighter than others. Some are pure black. They're just melanistic fox squirrels. They're not a different species. They're not protected. It's just a mutation in their genes. And they do interbreed. Um, if they, they, the only time squirrels fight with each other is over territory. And the, the red fox squirrels don't fight more with the black fox squirrels. They'll fight with anyone who's in their territory who's not supposed to be there. Um, and sometimes they interbreed and we, Right here on campus, we have uh, squirrels that are black with a red tail and some that are black uh, bodies with, uh, excuse me, some are red bodies with a black tail. And so they do interbreed, no problem, and they do propagate. So the, the biggest problem we have with tree squirrels is that during the winter months especially, or sometimes when we have dry times, they will girdle these trees. And if it's a high-priced tree, they'll girdle a lot. And if they girdle all the way around, from that point up, is dead. And they're doing this for a micronutrient. And it seems like we, or moisture, we can't put water out for them and have it work. We try that. And we can't supplement them with the, the nutrients. If they want that micronutrient, they want to get it out of the bark of the tree, they're going to use the bark of the tree, period. Now, repellents work to some degree if the nutrient isn't very, very, very necessary. So we can use repellents. What we can't use repellents on for squirrels is to stop them from climbing or finding a place to give birth. That's too strong. Repellents won't work on that. Um, and sometimes squirrels steal stuff from the garden as well. Here's one taking strawberries. Control them. Okay, so we can live trap squirrels. Um, out of the state limits, you, you can shoot squirrels um, if you don't use the meat or fur, even out of se squirrel season, if it's a pest on your own property, okay? If you're taking them on someone else's property or you're going to utilize the meat or fur, you have to get a license, a game license to take the squirrels and only take them during season. But you, it's the depredation li uh, uh, license or you can take, Game Parks allows you to take a squirrel by firearm outside the city limits 
if it's you're not going to utilize the Fermi and it's on your own property and they're causing damage. And that's the way with most of these fur bearing animals, except for deer. There you have to have a license no matter what. Even you can get the predation license on deer as well. But back to the squirrels. I usually use a trap. I put it at the base of the house where they're climbing up or the tree that they're using. And I usually get a piece of corn, like a quarter ear of sweet corn, hard sweet corn. You can probably even use field corn. And I smear it with peanut butter and put walnuts on it. And in all these traps, I probably should, um, I don't put the bait in the trap. I use a piece of baling wire and I hang it. So if for squirrels, I have it hang pretty low. For raccoons, I have it hang in the middle. You don't want it better that if they look in and they see the food hanging there, not on the ground. They're less likely to put their paw in. They're more likely to go right in for it. Now with squirrels, you don't have to cover this. With a lot of animals, you have to cover it. And then you can have the squirrel trap. And they do make tunnel traps that you can put on a tree uh, that are round that can uh, stop them. Now, to stop squirrels from going to bird feeders, if the bird feeder is away from a tree so they can't hop from a house or a pole to the bird feeder, you can hang the bird, bird feeder down and you want to hang it um, about from 10 foot down to about just above eye level to about um, seven to eight foot. And if you do it with Nexolite, the Nexolite is a stainless steel porcupine wire and you twist it. They can't climb down this whatsoever and they can't jump onto it, okay? Now, they can jump onto the, uh, the feeder if they can get to the feeder. So the feeder has to be six inches away from any, six feet, excuse me, six feet away from anything, because they can jump vertically six foot. So if your feeder is hanging with a six foot radius around it, and it's hanging at least six foot down, and, it's, and you don't want to put this where people can stab their face into it, so you want it hanging above eye level, and so there's nothing above it for six foot as well, except for this Nexolite, N-I-X-A-L-I-T-E, buy it online, and it, it really stops the squirrels from getting into those feeders. These type things only work on telephone poles with no trees around, and they, where they can't jump onto the wires. But, so again, these have to be at least six foot off the ground, have to be three foot from beginning to end, and then they can't jump over it, and they slide down it when it's covered with petroleum jelly. So exclusion and trapping. And if, you, you, if they're in your attic, you can put this up in the attic and trap them out of the attic as well. Okay, we already talked about opossums. I'm gonna go on to woodchucks next, if there's no other uh, particular species you want me to hit. We're getting down to our last 15 minutes or so. Um, so woodchucks, again, they're a ground squirrel like the 13 line ground squirrel, true hibernators, except their hole is not three inches in diameter. Their hole is eight inches to 10 inches in diameter. And they will go back 20 foot into a bank. So they can go under a barn, they can go under a shed and dig out a lot of dirt. And they usually have a big pile of dirt around their main entrance. And this is one of the only animals that we talked about that's what we call diurnal. They sleep all night and they're out during the day. Okay. And they do rob stuff like cucumbers and apples and fruit from the vegetable garden. And the only way to get rid of them, the only way to take care of them is excluding them out of the area, which is tough, or box trapping them because you can't use any poison. You can't use leg holes or anything like that on a woodchuck. Okay, um, especially in the city limits. And they have family units where the young stay with the mother for one year and the male lives in a different hole. Now, they're fairly easy to live or box trap if you know how to do it. But before doing that, the easier way to do it is to use row gravel or pea gravel, at least a five gallon bucket of it. Find their main entrance. They only have one main entrance and one escape entrance. 
find the main hole, the one that has all the dirt around it, and that's about eight to 10 inches, and it's round. If it's round, it's a woodchuck. If it's oblong, 10 by six inches, that's a badger. We'll talk about them later, okay? But woodchuck, you're gonna, it's gonna be circular, a lot of dirt, okay? And it's gonna be eight to 10 inches in diameter, almost perfectly round. And it'll go right in perfectly round, okay? What you wanna do is while they're in, while they're out, so during the day, okay, preferably, you're going to pack in the opening, and even if they're in there, they'll come out the emergency escape, five, at least five gallons of row gravel and pack it in good. Okay, and then put the dirt over it and pack about an inch of dirt on top of that road gravel. Okay, and then you can plant grass or anything back on that. Okay, that discourages a lot of them. Um, if you can put a five gallon bucket of lava rock, pack it deep in there about 12 inches in, and then a five gallon bucket of pea gravel on top of that lava rock, that really discourages them to go on to the next acre okay, and move out. Okay, other than that, if you really want to trap them and get them completely gone from the whole acre, they're very leery about new things in your environment. So what you do is right outside the hole, and it's best to do this at nightfall right after they go in, okay, is you're going to get one of the cages that has um, opaqueness. If you want to use it, if it isn't opaque, you're going to put a piece of burlap over it. And then you're going to wire this open. And you're going to put a, a half a cucumber, a half an apple in there. And you can put it right next to where their hole is. And you're going to let them, for three or four days, go in there and steal the food. Because they walk really slow at first. Once they're used to going in there fast, they'll get in there. And, and then you'll unwire this. So like the seventh or eighth day, unwire it. And then you'll, you'll get them caught. If you don't, what's gonna happen, they'll be halfway in, paw towards the food, and this will come down, hit their butt, and they'll back out, okay? So you have to do it this way. Another way you can do it, if you didn't wanna do this type, is use the two opening cage and shove one opening very close in parallel, not perpendicular, this one would be perpendicular to the opening, parallel to the opening, and you put burlap over it, but you have both sides open. And so, and then you put food out just outside the second opening. So he wakes up, he comes out and you have burlap over it and it's all dark and you have a weight on it or dirt around it. It looks like it should, someone put a porch on his tunnel and he'll come out and as soon as he gets to the middle of that long cage with the two openings, both sides will go down, okay? And so you have the food out there, he'll go out there faster. And so you catch him with both sides down. But you have to be tricky with a woodchuck. If you just set the trap, you won't get him. You have to make it so it looks like an extension of their tunnel, or if you're gonna use bait, you're gonna to have to have it opaque and pre-bait and tease them to come in there about seven, five to seven days previous. Now, with the woodchucks, again, you can't translocate them more than 100 yards. That's it. You can move them 100 yards, let them go, and it'll probably be haze not to come back to that location. Question, do woodchucks climb trees? They'd rather not, but if, if dog's after them, they will. They're, they, they, they have a hard time climbing. They're pretty clumsy. Um, I chased one once right up to a chain link fence, and he didn't even try to climb. He tried to dig underneath the chain link fence, and I was able to grab him with my gloved hands because he couldn't dig fast enough, but he could have climbed over that fence pretty fast and he decided that he couldn't climb. And so I wouldn't say it's impossible. They're not likely to, but if, if they're pushed, if a dog's after him and they, they can't dig, I can see one climbing a tree enough to get out of the way, but they're not very good climbers. They're very clumsy. They're not like a raccoon, that's for sure. Speaking of raccoons, next. The raccoons, they're one of the, I mean, they carry a lot of diseases. They carry rabies, uh, ringworm. You don't want them in your yard defecating uh, in the sandbox. You don't want them defecating in your attic. 
Uh, you don't want them defecating or having young in your fireplace just because of a large amount of raccoons. And so one thing about raccoons is that they can fight back and I, I, I've gone hand-in-hand -hand combat on someone's, in someone's bedroom and they tore all the drapes off the window and it got trapped in there. They ruined the bed and you know, I, I won the battle, but it was a tough battle. Um, raccoons fight back more than anything. They'll kill a cat. They'll kill an average sized dog. Um, so raccoons are nothing to be toyed with. Um, outside the city limits, there's a season on raccoons. They're a game species. If they're a problem, they can be dispatched with a firearm on your property. If you're not using the fur meat, if they're causing problems. You can box trap raccoons fairly easy. Now, with raccoons, you want to hang from the top with a piece of bailing wire. You want to use marshmallows because then you won't get cats, you won't get skunks. Raccoons love marshmallows. Most of the other animals do not love marshmallows. So if you want to go for raccoons and raccoons alone, hang marshmallows with a wire. Don't put them on the bottom, hang them in the middle at eye level. They see the marshmallows, you have the, this covered with burlap so they can't see the marshmallows from the side. They see a dark tunnel with marshmallows hanging in there. They get in there and they get trapped. You want the box trap that's about 10 inches to a foot square to get the, um, get the raccoon. Okay. Well, we've got one question before the skunks. So if you have any questions on the raccoons, again, there's been studies done with radio collars. If you translocate a raccoon more than 100 yards, it's a slow agonizing death for like 99% of the raccoons. The other raccoons beat them up. They don't know where to find water. And it'd be like me taking you, putting you in a foreign land in a real, real bad city that you don't know the language in and you can't, you know, you won't make it out, okay? Um, and so it's more humane to euthanize a raccoon than translocate it by far. Besides, you're not transmitting diseases to other areas and you're not giving the problem to other people. So really raccoons is one of the reasons why Indian Parks came up with the translocation uh, regulation um, because it's not good for anything, wildlife, the raccoon, or people to translocate them. Now, you could haze them. I want to go one more thing with raccoons. If you, raccoons are giving birth right now. So if you think you have a raccoon in your attic or chimney, you can get them out. And the way you do it, you want to get them out of your attic before you patch it up. And you can try to trap them in the attic, but that'd be tough, especially if she has babies. She will move the babies if you make the attic non-hospitable to her. She sleeps during the day and feeds her babies during the day. She's out feeding at night. So all day long, up the chimney or in the attic, put up a battery-operated strobe light with loud music. So it's like a disco in your attic, okay? You can use di disco music, you know? You know, sunshine band, I don't care. Um, but make it so she can't sleep. Then let it, at night, turn that stuff off. Your neighbors will love it if you do that too. Turn it off. And then have it dark around your house. And don't go watch. What she will do, and she'll probably only do two a night, so it may take her a couple of nights, she will move those babies to a new location. Okay? Hopefully a hollow tree and not your neighbor's house. Then once she knows she's gone, then you can patch up with metal and fence the way she got into your attic or chimney or put one of these things on the chimney, stop them going to the chimney. Okay, two questions here. First one is, what is the spelling of next life squirrel proof? I think you spelled it right, N-E-X-A-L-I-T-E. -E. Okay, so it's just be next light. I think that, pretty sure that's it. If you type either one in there the, into Google, it'll correct you or find it for you. Um, other question, is there any way 
can't get rid of snakes. Must be Nicole. My question is why, Nicole? Embrace them. They carry no diseases. They're the happy animal to have in your yard. But we'll talk about that in a minute. No, get snakes tonight. Okay. How big a hole can a raccoon get through? A raccoon can get through a pretty small hole, but it, it's about oh, the size of a softball. If to make up, you know, size of a softball, which would be about five to six inches in diameter. And raccoons can tear their own holes really easy. They could pull up shingles, they could pull down soffit vents and things like that. So for Nicole or Gage County, we'll go to snakes. to that point there. Okay, so we have four types of garter snakes in Nebraska. Okay, I'll just answer this one question about raccoon, I mean, woodchucks first. Is it illegal to shoot a woodchuck outside the city limits? Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think so. Outside the city limits, if there are vermin, you can use a firearm. And there is a fur season on them occasionally. So yes, you can shoot them um, outside the city limits if you wanted to. That's woodchucks okay. or groundhogs, same animal, different name. So garter snakes are our biggest problem. Uh, in most cities and towns, there's more garter snakes in cities and towns. Now, I must say this because of who I am. Garter snakes carry no germs and viruses transmittable to people or pets. They carry no fleas or ticks transmittable to people or pets. They eat earthworms and insects. Their teeth are less than an eighth of an inch. So like I always told my kids when they were growing up, they're all adults now, they couldn't bring home any dogs and cats because they got big teeth, they have distemper, they have fleas, ticks, West Nile, all this stuff. I wouldn't bring home any snakes for health reasons, because they can't get any health problems with snakes. Now, people say, well, I'm afraid of them. Well, that, you know, that's called ophidiophobia, and it is a disease, so to speak, a mental disease caused by not knowing. So we try to educate people, why do we need to get rid of snakes? They can't get, they can't chew through anything. They can't chew through duct tape. So they, if they get into a house, it's only because there's already a hole there that you should patch up so you don't get mice. And this is the same for almost all snakes, except for our venomous snakes, which are far and few between, unless you're out on the other side of Carmen. And we'll talk about them in a minute. So when we're talking about garter snakes or bull snakes, we're, the only thing we're worried about is a mental illness called ophidiophobia. And so we try to cure that with education. If we can't cure that with education, We'll go through a couple other things. But remember, they're beneficial. The bull snake is eating rodents only, and the garter snake is eating insects and earthworms only. The rattlesnake also is only eating rodents, but we have a little bit of, you know, we get one or two bites a year, and it's usually by people who want to kill them, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so garter snakes are our number one problem, and there is a 16 page video on controlling garter snakes controlling and managing garter snakes in the website wildlife.unl.edu that I wrote. So you can go to that if you want even more information. One, habitat. They love this type of habitat. Tall grass, limestone. And they can slide in. And these big piles are when they're mating. And you can pick them up while they're mating and, and they're really fine with it. If you change it to this type of landscape, or this type of landscape, you're less likely to have them. Here it is clean, not a lot of tall grass, really tight, okay? Not a lot of places where they can find cracks to get in. So habitat modification helps. The one thing we found that they don't like is lava rock landscaping. So if you put lava rock six, six, six inches deep by two foot wide, packed around your house, they don't like burrowing on it, they don't like going on it, they can't burrow in it, 
and they go the other way. So a cheap, easy way, if you don't want the garter snakes there, is to have lava rock landscaping. It could be the red, black, or brown, doesn't matter. Six inches deep, two foot wide, packed around your foundation. They will stay away from your foundation. Then they won't go up in your siding, try to get into your house where there's an opening, or up into your dryer vent. Yes, every year I get four to five people who wake up in the morning, they go down to their dryer, and there's a garter snake in their lint trap because their trap is within two foot of the ground and it's starting to get cold in October and they feel that warmth and those traps, those flaps never close all the way. And the garter snake goes up, goes through the dryer, ends up in the lint trap. Now for me, I get up in the morning, I pull out the lint trap, there's a garter snake, it means a wonderful day. But most people don't like garter snakes in their underwear. Um, I guess I'm a little different. Okay. But lava rock is one way to stop them from even getting near the house or the, the lint trap. So fencing, yes, you can fence them by having a quarter inch mesh fence like that. They can't climb up if it's a 30. And this is good around a playground where you have rattlesnakes. They can't get up that 30 degree and they'll stay away from that side where the children are. Now remember, the rattlesnake is the only thing that can hurt the children. And the, the other way, the children hurt the garter snake. So you want to keep the fence the other way to stop the children from hurting the garter snake. Okay. Any kind of caulking, any whole quarter size or even a dime size for a baby garter snake, they can get in. But they can't make their own hole. So caulking, putting a special a vent uh, thing around your dryer vent, and caulking on your siding. They love to get underneath the aluminum siding because it's warm. And once under aluminum siding, they'll keep going up because it's warmer as they go up and they can end up in the attic. And then they drop down through the last place you have lights on in the evening, which is usually the bedroom light fixture. So a couple of times I've had to get garter snakes out of off people's beds in the evening. So again, all in a day's work. I tested mothballs, lime, Dr. T's snake away, citrus, I tested 15 different products that were supposed to repel snakes. None of them worked at all. Every one of them, the snakes crawled right over it. Every one. And they crawled it over just as much as the control, which was, which was just gravel. So here's a snake going over six inches wide by six inches deep of Dr. T snake away. No, that we did find if you use mothballs, and a, the snake, which has live birth, the gar snake has live birth in the July. If she gives birth in a rock wall where there's mothballs, the babies all think mothballs means that's home. And they're attracted for mothball, to mothball smell the rest of their life. So one, it's illegal to use mothballs outdoors. But if you do, you'll be causing a thing that will allow baby gar snakes to always come to your yard. So again, we tested it. It was published, and the lawyers from Dr. T snake away, back down immediately. So again, worthless. Don't waste your money. Snakes, you cannot translocate them. Matter of fact, the law to translocate reptiles and amphibians came out 10 years before the other law. You have someone really pushing it, the person you're looking at, if you're looking at the small screen. So you can't translocate them or move a garter snake more than 100 yards. Um, you can move them less than 100 yards, but you can't move a garter snake more than 100 yards. Can you legally kill a garter snake? Oh, I didn't put that one in there. Yes, you can. You can use a hoe or anything. There's no poisons for garter snakes because all they eat is live stuff. So, why is it illegal to okay? Why is it illegal to use mothballs? One, mothballs are not labeled for outdoor use. Number two, kids pick them up and eat them as gumballs and die. Number three, they don't hurt other animals, but other animals like birds pick them up and get very sick, songbirds that are protected. So one, there's no repellency to them. Two, you're polluting the yard. And I do know of a case where someone put mothballs along the outside of their yard and their neighbor called them in and it was a $400 fine and that was in Lincoln. So is it illegal to put mothballs outdoors because the label says for indoor use only? 
and that makes it against a, fe a federal offense to use it against the label. And why do it? They don't work whatsoever. They don't work for anything. They don't work for rabbits, they don't work for mice, they don't work for birds. All they do is harm children and pets. Uh, there's some cases that a cat swallowed a mothball and actually almost died at the vet clinic. So again, all it does is harm our pets and children. It doesn't cause any repellency. So that was from Dakota. Okay, no other questions? We'll go back to where we were. Did I answer all your questions, Gage County, on the snakes? Because it looks like we're at 845. So is there any one thing that you really want me to cover in the next five minutes? Yes, Gage County says. Okay, how do you, okay, this is from uh, Hall County, Elizabeth Killinger. How do we keep garter, let me put garter there. They're garter snakes, like a woman's garter, okay? Not garden snakes. Uh, from climbing up on the porch. My first question is why? The second thing is um, because they're probably just sunning themselves. Um, if you put lava rock under the porch and two foot out around the porch, they won't be on the lava rock to get on near the porch to climb up the porch. So just have a two foot band around all the posts of the porch and edges of the posts of lava rock by, and I know lava rock is the worst landscaping for plants, but if you want to stop the snakes, that's the way we go. Starlings, two questions. Hmm, lava rock, okay. I don't like it either, but it's the only thing that works on. River rock attracts snakes. Lava rock makes them go the other way. Okay, starlings, we'll hit starlings. We have a question the starlings. I think we could hit that really quick. Get to the starling part of the... There we go, English darlings. Okay, so all the starlings we have in America today got here from 100 starlings brought over here by people who wanted the birds that are in England that were in William Shakespeare's plays and they let them loose in Central Park in New York City in 1868. And all the starlings we have in this country come from those 100. So you can blame those people. They are a species of bird, one of the few species of bird that you can kill, maim, get rid of in any way or form. They are an invasive species, they are non-native, and they cause a lot of disease problems and everything else. So we'll look, go through this kind of fast. Netting can keep them away. If you trim a tree so air can flow through it, like this, properly trim it and go to our horticulture department to learn how to do this, it will stop them. If you put the netting, just hang it vertically in the tree, it will also stop them from nesting in the tree. There is a poison out there called a starlicide that they feed on and they can die. However, a starlicide is a restricted use poison because so, it has to be put out that only way only starlings feed on it, on the ground mixed with cracked corn in a certain manner. So you can hire someone to use a starlicide and it would restrict the use license to poison starlings, but they have to prebate to make sure that only starlings and not songbirds take up that a poison. And I don't know, I was just reading, I think Beatrice is using a starlicide now. I know Omaha used starlicide and that was done actually by Wildlife Services, USDA Wildlife Services did work on starlings out of, uh, to get them out of Omaha. And I was reading, I thought it was Beatrice that was doing, was working on a uh, government program to get rid of starlings by using starlicide. Okay. Out of sweet corn, you just have to bait them before they get to the sweet corn, before the sweet corn is ready and get them then. Um, and uh, commodity uh, farmers, who have a license for restricted use can obtain the starlicide. But remember, you wanna make sure that starlicide is put out properly because you don't wanna poison your cattle, you don't wanna poison your pets, and you don't wanna poison any songbirds. 
Because even if you say, I'm only after the starlings, and you kill a grackle, like a city in the northern part of Nebraska did with the starlicide, they were fined $400 a grackle they accidentally killed. So I did it by accident, it doesn't cut it with birds. Birds have a lobbyist like you wouldn't believe. So if you accidentally kill the wrong bird, you can't say, oh, it was an accident. It's a fine, period. So you have to use it as directed to kill just starlings and house sparrows. And it can be done. It can easily be done. So farmers can get starlicides, but they have to use it exactly as it says, or it's a federal offense. Okay. Can you keep starling? That's corn patch. How do we um, prevent uh, cardinals from attacking a side mirror of a car? Whitewash it and then wipe it with a, a rag as you start to travel. When you park it, whitewash it again. As long as it's got whitewash on it when it's parked, they won't see their image. Or you can bend the mirrors in if you have a truck like I do and have them bent in when you park. And then when you go to drive for your safety, bend it back out. You can also put streamers in front of it, yellow and red streamers in front of the mirror, tape to the mirror, but that would, I think, would be in the way of your thing. What about your Asian collar gloves, doves? They're on that cusp. If they get decided that they're going to be an invasive species, they'll go on the list with the pigeon, starlings, and others. Right now, because people sometimes have a, a, uh, have a problem. If they're causing a problem on a farm, there, uh, there is agencies and there is help um, for economic damage by Eurasian collar doves. Call Game of Parks for that one. Okay, we got enough room for maybe one or two more questions. Does anybody have any more questions for Dennis? We've got How about badgers? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. How about badgers? Oh, badgers. Badgers are nomadic. <laughs> um, so with badgers, you can tr first try, you can try the, you have to try um, putting in the lava rock packed with row gravel on top of it. You can trap badgers. To trap badgers is a little bit difficult. I usually trap pretty good, but uh, it's best to have a professional do it. For one, badgers are really mean. Number two, the trapping of badgers, it's not a, you have to have a permit to use the trapping method. The trapping method is you use a 13 line ground squirrel or a kangaroo rat. You put them in a small cage, live, in a big cage, and the badgers run right in there but you, you have to have a permit to do that. Okay. Otherwise, you can dispatch, dispatch badgers with a firearm outside the state limits. We have a couple skunk questions. Oh, okay. What do we do about skunks that keep coming to the house and eating the dog food at night? Bring the dog food in at night. Um, because they're traveling from a location. Um, I could tell you how to trap those skunks, but uh, if you don't do it exactly right, it's a stinky proposition for you. Um, you can't bait skunks. Um, you, can't, you don't wanna put any leg traps out or you're gonna catch dogs and cats. Um, so you can cage trap skunks and euthanize them. Matter of fact, if you cage trap a skunk, you should euthanize them. They're the no number one carrier of rabies in the state of Nebraska. So you don't want to get your hands anywhere near a skunk. So if you have skunk problems and you want to trap, that would call a professional. Or to make them not come up for the dog food, just bring the dog food in every night. Because they're nocturnal. And you need to trap a skunk. The best way to trap them is with a chicken innards, that stuff I usually throw away that they put inside the chicken, you know, the neck and gizzards and all that crap. And I just put that in the cage and I get skunks right away. How do you remove a skunk from backyard? Okay, it has to be opaque cage. 
so they can't spray through it. You put hanging from the top of the opaque cage, you drill a hole in the, in the opaque cage. That's a plastic one we use for the woodchucks. On the end of that wire, you put the, the neck and the heart and I crack an egg on top of it. And I put it out overnight. And I use again the first night, the skunk rubs, runs in there and it's trapped. Now, if you know you got a skunk in there, he can't spray you if he's in the opaque trap. The hazard comes if you try to let the skunk out. So what needs to be done is that trap with the skunk in it needs to go into a, a, a CO2 chamber so it's put to sleep. And so you would bring it to animal control or a place like that, or if you have a CO2 chamber. And if you decide you wanna shoot it through the opaque trap, you ruin your opaque trap, and I almost guarantee that it will probably release on you as you're shooting or when the gun hits the plastic. So it's best to, if you're gonna have it put in the opaque trap, bring it to a proper place or have the proper authorities pick it up. Okay, that looks like the last question. Well, thank you, Dennis. I really appreciate you okay. going over critters in the landscape with us tonight. Okay, um, I hope I covered everything, but if there's anything that I didn't cover, wildlife.unl.edu. Click on damage and find your critter. And I put the last poll question up. So if you guys yeah. can fill that out for me, I would really appreciate it. And I will see all of you next week for um, weather ready landscapes and the environment in your landscape. So I will see you all next week. And good night. I'm signing off.